Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the second developer meetup um, this, um, this, this autumn. This month, we have uh, two fabulous speakers, Flor Drace and Wesley Faulkner. I'm sure many of you know them. They're very active in uh, the developer communities, in the DevL community, lots of social communities as well. Uh, so I'm really, really thrilled they are here. Um, to explore together with us um, how to build and nurture um, developer relations at events. Um, so I would first like to introduce um, Floor, who will be giving a talk on uh, setting yourself up for DevL uh, success. Uh, Floor, would you like to briefly introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, sure. So my name is uh, Floor. I am based in the Netherlands. Uh, I actually recently moved from the DevRel team at uh, Ivan to the community team. Uh, and so I will be sharing a little bit about uh, how uh, how I'm supporting the DevRel team now in my new function. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to sharing some of my stories with, with you all tonight. So second up is um, Wesley, um, also a well-known contributor to all uh, great communities. Wesley, would you briefly introduce yourself as well? Sure. My name is Wesley Faulkner. Uh, I've been doing developer relations for five years, both as a person focusing on developer advocacy and also as a community manager. My current role is I am a senior community manager for AWS for North America, mostly managing user groups. And my presentation today is getting through the awkwardness of networking. And this is one of the first ever presentations that I've ever created as a DA. And so it's a little oldie, but I think a lot of the, the, the high level points are still very relevant. Terrific, really, really looking forward to, uh, to your talk. Um, after our two talks, we will have a Q and A with uh, Flor and Wesley. Um, and um, um, anyone joining us on YouTube can share their questions or thoughts they would like to share if they feel inspired. Uh, you can share your thoughts on our YouTube chat. And uh, Sarah Grunison and myself will be uh, looking at your uh, questions and thoughts and sharing these with uh, Floor and, uh, and Wesley today. Um, Sarah, would you like to briefly introduce yourself as well? Um, I'm Sarah from uh, Novoda. I'm the Director of Engineering at Novoda and also the founder of Avagasa Coaching. I'm here to help facilitate and I'm really looking forward to this. So am I, and thank you so much for joining us and uh, and helping us tonight. Um, so that leaves me, I'm Wendy De Volder. Um, I help developer first tooling businesses and open source uh, projects um, engage and grow and nurture their communities um, at Devella, uh, which is a, a consultancy. Um, so um, Floor, shall we hand over to you? Uh, yes, so today I wanna talk about setting up uh, your uh, setting up DevRel for success, basically. Um, and I know that I've introduced myself uh, real quick just now, but uh, but let me expand on that for a little bit. Uh, so my name is uh, Floor based in the Netherlands. Uh, I'm an art school graduate, so I took a little bit of a weird route into uh, technology, but I'm here now and I'm not going anywhere. Um, I'm currently a staff community program manager at uh, Ivan. Uh, I've worked in DevRel teams at Microsoft and Grafana Labs and at a bunch of startups. Um, so I have a couple of years of experience under my belt in developer relations. Um, I'm also a DevOps Days core member and I organize the DevOps Days Amsterdam and DevOps Days Eindhoven conferences. Um, other conferences too, so maybe a community overcode uh, in Bratislava uh, next year in, in June. Uh, that's the former Apache Con. Uh, I organize way too many meetups. Uh, it's cost me a lot of time, <laughs> actually. Um, we were supposed to do another meetup tonight as well uh, in person, but then there is a massive storm going on in the Netherlands. and. Uh, um, we decided that it's better to postpone that one, but it's a good thing because then I can fully give all of my attention uh, to all of you today here. Um, so like I said, I, earlier this year, I switched from the uh, DevRel team at Ivan to the community team. Um, and while my reporting line has changed, uh, my responsibilities or, or OKRs or V2Moms or uh, the framework we're currently using have changed uh, my day-to-day -day somewhat uh, the way that I approach uh, 
event engagement uh, hasn't. In fact, I am now in an excellent position uh, to influence other people to uh, be more intentional, uh, intentional about the events that they visit and, and how they show up at the events. Um, and I would like to share with you a couple of ways that I help uh, colleagues uh, prepare for events uh, in know before you goes or uh, their schedule building or scheduling appointments while they're at an event. Um, and to sort of like stick to that plan of attack and then also to uh, sort of like wrap it all up with a nice bow and a trip report and follow ups. Uh, so that's what we were talking about today. All right. I love how this is working super well. I'm sorry. So starting with, um, of course, we don't have the luxury of starting a, a fiscal year afresh with uh, all the events having their CFPs out, they have their ducks in a row, and we can plan ahead for the coming year. Um, we can show up in the geos that we want, we can get great coverage. Instead, events are very messy and we sort of have to get with the program. Um, the way that I get with the program is I keep a list of strategic events uh, for us to show up at. And that is a combination of uh, events that the company uh, that I'm at uh, spoke at before. Uh, the colleagues have attended these events and they have recommended me these. Uh, it's the result of research of the topic area of events that make sense, uh, can be industry events, can be big partner events, etc. Uh, I will have subscribed to their newsletter so that I know exactly when their CFP opens. Um, and I will follow and actually contribute to listicles like cons.tech and sessionize and paper call to figure out when a CFP opens. Um, and once a week, and you see this to the right of the slide, uh, I post a list of CFPs that are closing soon in a channel uh, at Ivan uh, in, in Ivan Slack where folks who do public speaking or who would like to do public speaking hang out. Uh, and that is speakers, speakers Corner. Um, so at Ivan, we do we all do talk rehearsals, no matter how experienced of a speaker you are. Um, and colleagues will attend these rehearsals because uh, sometimes they are not in the engineering department and they just want to learn more about our stack. Um, they might be very uh, invested in a technology that someone is going to talk publicly about. Um, or they do or they consider doing public speaking and they want to learn how others do that. Um, or they might just be curious what we talk about when we're at events. And the feedback that you get from this exercise is, is super, super helpful um, in the way that most every work gets better from peer reviews. Um, so for example, uh, someone was planning to use a Chuck Norris jokes data set at the JavaScript conference where the majority of the audience is way too young to understand that reference or um, a workshop where um, that required an integration to be enabled for a, um, uh, for a GitHub organization that he had moved the repository with all of the assets for the workshop to, um, or just the encouragement to be unapologetically yourself while you're on stage. Um, it's always been a super wonderful experience uh, just doing a dry run of your public speaking for colleagues that are really invested in your success. Um, now, how we do an arranged speaker's corner is a topic uh, in and of itself, and I will stop gushing about it, but uh, an added benefit from having something like speaker's corner and people celebrating in that channel when their talks have been selected, uh, we have a much better overview of who is going where for what event uh, so that we can then try and uh, support them with jar packing. Jar packing. Uh, what do we mean by jar packing? So when someone is traveling for an event anyway, uh, we might want to investigate and see if we can help them combine it with some other activities while they're in, in a region. Uh, so can we reach out to the account teams to see if they can meet with any customers? Um, or can we loop in the partner team to see if we can uh, organize a, a meetup together? Maybe they have offices near the uh, events uh, location that we can uh, meet at. Um, are there active meetup groups that we could try and speak at um, or just attend for networking? Or do we know any of the other speakers uh, and can we uh, record something together while we're there? So maybe we can record a little podcast or a little video, a little live stream. Um, these 
things, of course, take a little bit of lead time to organize. Uh, so you want to get on those uh, quite quickly. So when the schedule is out, that's usually a good time to go look if there's any of these opportunities that we can make use of. Then we'll do a know before you go. Uh, so in all honesty, this is definitely still a muscle that we're building uh, at Ivan, but it's certainly something that I've done at previous uh, employers. And it's a meeting that is recorded with a slide deck where we'll go over things like what kind of people can we expect at this event? So for example, uh, when we want to go to FALSTEM, which is a massive open source conference in Brussels every year, um, we want to tell people that go there for the first time that Twitter or X is not something that is used there. You probably better want to use Mastodon if you want to uh, get into the conversation and definitely never sell at something like Fostem. Um, the slide deck will over also cover if there is any side events or socials that you might want to go to. Uh, we'll uh, go over if there is any partners or customers that are attending or sponsoring the event uh, and where you can find their booths to, to also have a, have a chat with them. Um, as uh, in Ivan's case, we're a managed solution for a bunch of open source projects. So maybe we want to reach out to these projects and see if we can run it both together. Um, that is very possible, for instance, at FOSDEM, uh, where there is a Postgres booth uh, or the Apache Software Foundation booth. Uh, we want to see if there's any of our competitors uh, attending, uh, because that might, uh, might uh, uh, indicate what kind of questions we can expect at the event. Uh, in terms of like how we benchmark towards them. Um, we want to get familiar with the session formats and the speakers. We want to familiarize the people that are attending the event uh, with the code of conduct, but also how to ask questions or connect with others at the event. Uh, so maybe there is a Discord server, or they might be using Slack or Slido or any of those fancy conference apps, and to make sure that they register for such an app and fill out their profile so that they're really approachable at the event. It will also contain some uh, suggestions for sessions to attend. Uh, it will contain a booth schedule if that's, uh, if that's applicable. Uh, and it will suggest a way of communicating with each other with colleagues that are at the same event, uh, which is usually a temporary Slack channel. Then uh, building his schedule. So when I attend a conference, I will build my own schedule, especially when it's a multi-track uh, event, even if they have a fancy conference app, uh, because I know what I need, and it's called a spreadsheet. Uh, <laughs> you can challenge me all you want, but there's nothing, there's nothing better than a spreadsheet, because I want times. I want a speaker name. I want a title. I want a talk title. I want a one-liner from the abstract. I want social accounts. I want a link to the live stream. I want all of all of these things, and uh, and you can't get me those in an, any other format that I can just copy and paste and use for my socials. So um, I will prepare that. Uh, I will also need to know if it's a multi-track event, how much time it will take me for, to go from one room to another so that I can build my schedule accordingly and I don't run out of energy. Um, I will also want to plan some booth visits and uh, honestly, bathroom breaks uh, because else I will forget. Um, so uh, little disclaimer, last year I was diagnosed with uh, ADHD and this level of planning is the result of a lifetime of coping mechanisms um, because I, I know that I will not stick to my plan if I don't plan it out this, this thoroughly. Um, so I feel like um, events are very overwhelming, uh, even or actually, especially for people who do this for a living. Um, if this is something that you might want to get into, um, but you can use whatever means you find comfortable, I'm fine with you not using a spreadsheet. Uh, but you will want to do this maybe two days out of the event because uh, an event schedule is bound to change a lot, certainly in the last two weeks leading up to an event with people getting sick or having other priorities. OK, so while you're at the event, um, I want to urge you to fully be at the event. So in the past, I've been very, very frustrated uh, to the point where I wrote a blog about it. So then you know how frustrated I've been uh, with developer advocates who would show up at events, uh, joining late 
or leaving right after a talk or not engaging in the sessions that uh, are related to yours. Uh, it's rockstar behavior and it's not actually doing yourself or your company any service uh, because you alienate event organizers, attendees, fellow speakers uh, when you're that off vibe and you can't afford that. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to break it to you. Um, so I try to be the ideal uh, conference entity when I speak at an event, uh, I will participate in almost all of the sessions. I will ask you questions. I will post on social media. I will take flattering pictures of speakers, uh, which is not a courtesy that, that a lot of people do. Uh, I have seen some pictures of me that are not great. Um, I will take part in all of your audience participation bits. Uh, I will be that one person uh, sitting front row, nodding violently at everything you're saying uh, and giving you a good feeling. I feel like that's the right thing to do. Uh, we need to show up for each other. But also, I am just building up my database of potential speakers and people that I want to collaborate on uh, live streams with. I want to spot out future colleagues. I'm, I'm there to to work. This is, this is my job. Um, so I'm fully there, I'm in the moment, uh, and to do so, I put an out of office in my uh, email, I will update my Slack uh, and set myself to away. Uh, I will mark my calendar as busy, and yet, of course, I will receive meeting inv invites. Um, and I've spoken to a number of my colleagues uh, at, uh, at Ivan, but also certainly outside of Ivan, uh, and I noticed that overwhelmingly women don't allow themselves the freedom to fully participate in an event and they don't feel the freedom to uh, decline incoming requests. And we will need to address that at some point, but maybe not at this meetup. Meet up. Maybe there will be another follow-up talk for that one. Um, anyway, so while most conferences will have a workroom for people to take calls, try and keep your work, work calls to a minimum. Now, I know that it, that's much easier if it's just a one-day event uh, and not a multi-day event, but, but try. Um, related, sometimes we will meet colleagues or friends at, the, at these events. And uh, while that can be really nice, especially when you're mostly remote uh, most of the time, uh, try and strike a balance and make sure that you meet a lot of new people too. And I, I bet Wesley will explain to us how to interact with new people uh, in, in his session later. Um, there might be miscellaneous opportunities at an event. So there could be a job board uh, that you can post your company's uh, open position at. There might be a sticker exchange table. If you're not a sponsor this time around, but you did bring stickers, that's still a way to uh, get your brand out there. There might be side events that you can take an active uh, part in. And uh, when your talk is not accepted this time around, it is still pretty smart to come prepared. Uh, an event might have opportunities for uh, impromptu sessions that might be like a lightning talk or an ignite or uh, open spaces, breakout sessions. So you might still be able to bring some of your content. And uh, like I said before, you build your schedule only two days uh, ahead of an event because things change and, and speakers might still need to drop out. And uh, offering the organizers that you could, could do a backup talk if need be, uh, is a great way to still make it on stage. Of course, you don't hope that anyone drops out, but you know, they do. All right, so the event was a marvel. And uh, now we're, we come to the, the day after or the days after, and you will want to report back internally what you've done at the event, what you've learned, what you take away uh, with you. Um, and that's the trip report. And a trip report is an awkward document. Um, because you want to share some metrics, but you also want to share some stories, and it's very hard to combine those two. But um, you want some level of standardization, so you want to uh, at least mention a couple of numbers, like number of people that showed up uh, to your session, um, and when it's a multi-track event, maybe that's uh, also a percentage of how many people are there in total. Uh, you want to see if if you uh, if you create a side event, if you host a side event, how many people showed up to that. Um, maybe supplement this if there was a live stream with uh, some of the online viewers. Uh, and if you have a call to action, and of course you should have a call to action, how, how did that perform? So there is a little bit of metrics there, uh, but then you want to supplement that with, uh, with anecdotes. 
So what did people in the hallway uh, track wanted to talk to you about? What kind of questions did they have? Uh, what themes were most prominent uh, at the event, uh, both in, at the program, in the, in the program and in the hallway track? Um, do we have a good story there? Um, should we be sharing that story in different channels in order to be part of the conversation? Uh, that's, that's really insights that you can bring back to your company. The way we do uh, trip reports at Ivan uh, is, uh, well, first of all, as quickly as possible after the event, uh, when everything is still fresh. Um, we have a form that you fill out where it covers some of the bullet points, some of that, those metrics, and some of the opportunities to share some anecdotes. Um, those answers land into a doc, and then you can add your pictures to that document and work with colleagues who also maybe attended the event in a different capacity, um, and you can collaborate it on it uh, asynchronously. Um, so the and the outcome of that trip report that is shared internally, and then it's stripped of all of the internal stuff like how did the competitor show up, um, and then we can use that uh, in our more out, like external facing uh, content channels. So that might be in a newsletter, that might be on our forum, um, and in our monthly uh, roundups as well of all of the events that we attended. Um, um, of course, then there's also all of the follow-ups. Uh, so following up with all of the people that you've met, maybe you need to make connections to uh, colleagues from different departments, if that's appropriate. Um, you might want to add notes to your CRM if you've met uh, community members uh, for a first time or second time uh, about the topics that you've discussed and you could follow up on. Uh, you want to write that. You want to write uh, post that write up uh, that you or the trip report that you've stripped off of all of the internal stuff that is now a write up. Um, maybe there's a video recording of a meetup that you ran. Um, there might be the, all of the 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 little recordings that you've done. Um, then conferences uh, usually release some sort of like a photo gallery or talk recordings in the weeks after the event. Um, that is likely when you have already. Uh, mentally moved on to the different stages for other events, uh, but still make sure that those links make it to the trip reports and put in a pipeline for social media uh, uh, content again. So at Ivan, we have these uh, speaker pages for the people in DevRel and sort of related, <laughs> related uh, teams uh, where we share all of the slides and uh, links to talk recordings. Um, so that's uh, the which is a very simple update in, in our in our CRM, um, so that people can uh, with the added benefit that someone could go to my speaker page and figure out what kind of topics I usually talk about if they are thinking about inviting me to another event. Um, and then, if this was a net new event, consider if it was worth your effort uh, and put it in the event calendar for next year. Uh, so that way, we can keep track of the CFB and we don't miss the deadline for that one. So. Events aren't linear, uh, and not all events uh, offer the same opportunities, but uh, there is still some level of standardization that you can do uh, to make sure that you uh, show up uh, in, in, in a good way. Um, and, and it's very necessary for any community team that is building the plane while it's flying, which is every community team everywhere, always. Um, at present, we at Ivan, we have a templating and automation around tickets uh, around an event. So there will be tickets on the talk board in order for us to schedule these talk uh, rehearsals. Uh, the field marketing team, if we have, uh, if we do co-sponsoring for event, there will be swag request forms. There will be travel approval processes. Um, we're fairly locked into Asana, and we can't use certain other tools that rhyme with Fair Cable. Uh, but I think that with a little bit more duct tape, this might actually really work. Uh, and for us, it doesn't need to be very pretty in order for us to have that framework uh, so that we can show up at events, uh, make the most out of an event, and be our best selves at an event. Uh, I hope that was useful. I'm very curious to hear from you how you prepare for, for next conference season. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Flora. That was awesome. Um, so prep well, um, I took took away. And um, I really, really liked as well uh, anecdotes because um, sometimes when I work with 
teams going to conferences. Um, there's a, a lot of focus on metrics, uh, but I think the anecdotes and the actual conversations and uh, and the themes that that um, that are being discussed are really really valuable for product teams, marketing teams, devel teams. So, yeah, terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so next up, Wesley. Um, with a talk on how to get through the awkwardness of networking. Um, I know myself, um, I sometimes find it very hard. Um, I find it hard to, to stand for a long time and, and that sometimes affects me and my ability to have good conversations. Um, so I'd love to, to learn from, um, from Wesley. Um, over to you. Thank you. Great. Um... Do I need to share my slides again to, yeah. to get them on the screen? Okay, let me just do that. Boop -boo -boo. Uh, talks amongst yourselves. Why do you drive on a parkway? Drive and park on a driveway. Uh, let's see. There we go. And hopefully you can see my slides now. All right, great. So uh, amazing presentation floor. Uh, super jealous of your presentation skills. Uh, I would like to preface this by saying the slides are there for my prompting. So generally ignore them. Uh, I'm just gonna use them just so I can talk. Um, so I developed this presentation uh, as my first presentation as a DA and it kind of really embodies my transition to being more outgoing because uh, I, I was just getting on stages. I was just going to presentations and conferences and it was all new to me. And uh, that kind of was kind of skills that I put together to kind of figure and find my way through those spaces was kind of my awkwardness that I had myself. So I, I was, uh, I'm a child of immigrants. My mother is from, uh, Haiti and my dad is from the British Virgin Islands. So uh, on one side of my family uh, didn't even speak on the same language as the other side of my family. And then uh, they eventually moved to the US and this is, and I was born here. And so I, I kind of grew up with a lot of cultures, a lot of languages, a lot of things to do, things not to do, things that are taboo and things that are just, um, just not super social in different contexts. And so that's kind of like I am awkward and this is my guide for all those fellow awkward people. And so let's talk about why networking is so hard. Uh, and the reason why it's so hard is because we don't really get taught it uh, when we're in university or even in gra grammar school. Uh, it's just something that is supposed to just happen. The people who know other people might put you together saying blah, blah, blah. I like you to meet blah, blah, blah. And then they kind of put you together and they give you a little context and you're able to kind of meet each other and then start from that spot. Uh, but if you're out in the real world, it doesn't really happen that way. You have to do that work yourself. And some of the, the things that we try to figure out is like, how do we begin that conversation? Who do you approach? Um, what Like when you do approach someone, how do you choose what to talk about that's not too sensitive, but also not too fluffy, like how's the weather? What is a way to have like those sensitive conversations? And um, like, when do you know who is the right person to even approach? And the truth is we're all kind of bad at it because of this kind of awkwardness. It's like a dance and you're one person's doing the polka and the other person is doing the the, like a, 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 a rumba or a something classical. You, you're, you're trying to like feel each other out, figure out who's leading, who's following and uh, what direction you wanna go. It's all kind of weird. And the reason why it's weird is because we've all been taught wrong for those who have like, I think I'm good at it or I think I know who's good at it. Let me take notes, let me do some observations um, that uh, we've been taught like some traditional ways of networking, like. Uh, especially if you're talking about media or you're talking about movies or, or television shows, you know, firm handshake, kind of like dominate the conversation, uh, show your expertise, showcase why you're an important person. And those are, those are ways that, yeah, those are ways. <laughs> um, but I'm sure that you've met 
those people who are just super into themselves, uh, they are really almost showing off with every comment and in the way that they're, they're relating to you. And it's really hard to feel you're at the same level or that you are in a place where you can just kind of live up to the kind of fanciness that they just presented. And it doesn't, it's not good footing. It's not a good place to start that relationship. One other caveat I just want, I should have led with this is that this presentation is initially really focused on how to be interested in other people. Um, and I'll go at the end, if there's time, uh, oh, some, some ways of where you can be interesting to other people. So uh, I think it's more important to kind of focus on other people. And this is where most of the work is gonna come in. Um, one th other thing about uh, this presentation, um, Floor mentioned that she was recently diagnosed with ADHD. And I would like to say, Congratulations. Um, I also am neurodivergent and uh, uh, I also uh, am have ADHD and dyslexia. And so this presentation is somewhat ableist, um, but I just wanna put that out there that if you can't do everything on the list or if you don't resonate, it doesn't resonate with you, just take what you can that resonates with you and then just leave the rest because um, this is a genericized uh, kind, of, kind of presentation. So I also wanted to make sure I put that out there. So networking is hard. Everyone sucks at it, including me uh, at, in different situations. Um, but what I can do is just give you some tips to make it not suck as much. But the reason why you're having trouble is because we all have been given bad models. Those who are really good at networking, kind of, it feels as if it's effortless. It feels as if there's nothing that they're doing and it just happens naturally. And I think that natural occurrence uh, is uh, it's just a demonstration of someone who's had a lot of practice um, and has been able to have a very strong growth mindset. Someone who's been able to see something, make tweaks, make adjustments, and keep trying. Um, there, the, when I went and started doing public speaking, uh, I learned a statistic that 70% of people rather die than do public speaking. And uh, it's one of the greatest fears. And if you have that anxiety, that social anxiety as being amongst groups, being in a crowd or being kind of the center of attention or being part of something that's kind of like where you have to put yourself out there, uh, you are not alone. This is some difficult stuff. So um, I want to make sure that I stress that, that even if you see me and if you've been in an event with me and you think, oh, he's okay. He's not stressing out. I'm stressing hard time. It's just, I am good at masking. And so you may not understand that. Um, I'm a little bit of an extrovert, uh, but some people are also very um, introverted. So what I want you to do is make sure that you take care of yourself. Uh, if you ever feel like you're overwhelmed, if you ever feel like uh, you need some space or some air, please, please take care of yourself. Um, don't feel super dedicated to making sure that you're there to network so you, you feel forced. And being trapped is something that raises anxiety. And so you don't want to make sure you feel like you don't have a choice because that will exacerbate some of your problems. All right, now that we've gone over like why it's so hard, let's go over some basics. Um, once again, uh, this is not the most like uh, diverse slide, so I'm not totally proud of it, but don't look at it. Just, just listen to me, just face, focus here on this face. Um, so the basics, um, what you wanna do is kind of be present. You, you wanna make sure you're grounded in yourself. Uh, this is one of the things that it, it's gonna take practice, but clear your mind, try to understand where you are understand what's going on, understand who you're talking to. Take every nugget of what they're saying as a nugget. There's a, there's sometimes when we're anxious, we're kind of perched on the edge of our seat virtually or literally to kind of hop on the thing that we can relate to the most. Someone says, 
anime. I'm a huge anime fan. So I'm going to say, oh, oh, who's your favorite? I love blah, blah, blah. And you kind of get in it because you're like, this is something we both can connect on. And you kind of pounce at the chance. Um, this is natural. Uh, it's hard to fight. I'm going to urge you to fight it. Uh, I have problems here, but once again, uh, let's let's try to get better through practice. What you want to do is you want to let them talk. You want to let them speak. Let them get everything out. And this is going to feel awkward. It's going to feel uncomfortable because you're just sitting there going, doing this, right? Listening, reacting, listening. And so it's important to maintain eye ca contact as much as you can. Smile, react, do that active listening thing. Maybe throw in some uh-huhs and yeah, and that's, oh, and some surprises. But you want to let them complete. You want to let them finish. Uh, the reason why this part is important to have someone fully tell their story, fully kind of explain where they're coming from, if this is an introduction, is because sometimes people are uncomfortable and uh, they have their own track of what they want to get out. They have their own either script or saying, or basically their kind of even string of consciousness um, that it's important to let them just get it all out. You might attach to one thing, anime, whatever, but let that go through, make a note, and then keep listening. And you might miss out at some of the meatiest part of what they're trying to say or what they're trying to get to or how they're trying to um, kind of explain where they're coming from, from their own standpoint. This is, uh, think of it as an arc of a story. And when you hear that, uh, let's see, like, what is it? The Noah's Ark and Jesus talked to Noah. If you stopped right there where Jesus had a conversation, no, sorry, not Jesus, uh, God had a conversation with Noah. And you're like, oh my God, you talked to God. Uh, God, yeah. And then you're like, kind of like, that's amazing. Uh, I used to talk to God or I had an uncle who did. Um, well, at least he said that he talked to God, but no one really believed. It, it, you can kind of go off and that's not where the conversation was going. And you're a little hijacking, like the whole, like building an ark and gathering animals two by two and the, the great flood. Those are really big, important pieces. And so you don't want to cut that off. Um, because you, you want to make sure that there's room for them to kind of say their whole story. And then you can come back to, you, you talk to God and your, your uncle who also talked to God, um, if that was a thing that you think is still relevant. And that's the important part. What you're thinking may not always be relevant, especially in that part of the story. And so you make a note, come back to it if it's, if it's great. But what the thing is, if sometimes if you're locked in on that part, you, you just stop listening to everything else. You're just waiting for the pause. You're waiting to jump in and you're waiting to like show that you can participate. And this is once again, going back to being present, being grounded, listening to what they're saying, taking it in and just like understanding that their story is going to be unique. Don't feel like, oh no, I've heard this before. I, I know where this is going to end and then kind of mentally check out, listen to every word. It's once again, hard, not easy, but this is something that will help you in age you. Um, and you want to smile. You want to show positive reinforcement that you are engaged. And um, let's see. People want to know what, what, what they're saying is important. So once you get to the end of the story, once they've, said the whole thing, make sure you give them some feedback. Don't just go, oh, okay. And now about me. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, that sounds very interesting. But I used to build canoes. And uh, you should see my canoes too. It's really, no, no. Go ahead and give the affirmation and let them know what they say that they said is important, what they've done is important, and who they are is important even without that stuff. Um, one thing that is really important when you're making these connections is you try to connect to the person. You don't necessarily connect to what they do. You don't need to connect to what they've accomplished. The, this is extremely important because if you're connecting to what makes them, them on a fundamental level, 
then it doesn't matter if they lose their job. It doesn't matter if they don't have a job. It, it doesn't matter if they uh, spoke to God or they spoke to uh, a person on the street. It doesn't matter who these people are. The story is, in, of course, important. But when you're trying to connect, you really are trying to focus on the, the very personal level. Um, and I've had friends. Uh, I'm lucky enough to be super old and uh, had many careers before DeVerell. And I've had people who've changed careers. And especially in developer relations right now, it's, it's hard. Uh, floor just changed, changed jobs. And if I was really invested into what she did previously, and I hear that now she's doing community management, I'd be like, oh, well, I now know have, I have zero use for floor because she's not doing the thing that I found useful. You don't want to do that. What you want to do is like, I really connect to this person. I think that they're grounded ethically. I think we are really kind of connected spiritually, or we are in the same, um, we have some of the same drive for the advancement of the human human race the 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 pursuit of truth and justice those or whatever the thing is that you're looking for that's the kind of things you want to tease out and that's the thing you want to connect on um and uh, and that brings me back to some of the first things that people do when you meet someone what is usually the first question that someone asks when you meet someone? It's either where are you from or what do you do? And those two questions don't tell the whole story. Uh, I'm a person that tries to remove labels. I'm, I don't fit neatly in a box. Even, even, um, so uh, what, I, I hate asking someone, so, oh, so what do you do? You work in tech? And then now I'm the person that works in tech. Or you're a community manager? Oh, now I'm the person who's a community manager. Or I'm a podcaster. Um, or um, I'm, I'm neurodivergent. Um, uh, there's, there are things that I would say that describe me, but you're going to have to talk to me longer to understand all of me. And that is something that you want to make sure that you, you, you want to leave open the possibility that people are more than their jobs. They're more than their labels. And so when you ask someone where, where they're from and they say, I don't know, Florida, and they're like, OK, well, you hate books because you keep burning them or banning them. Uh, or if they have a job where they're a sanitation worker and be like, oh, that's all you do is just pick up trash. Then I don't know if we should have a conversation the, the, that judgment comes with those labels um, either like if someone feels like they're above you or below them it's it, when you're having these conversations you're not jockeying for positions you're not kind of outshine them and you're not trying to put them down um, but you're also not going to try to lift them up um, and you're just going to try to meet on a personal level so that's the thing that you kind of need to focus on is that you're going to be connecting to the person. You're not thinking of the best way to use the person to your advantage when you have these conversations. Um, I, I've <laughs> working for AWS. Sometimes people don't know it, especially you're not in the tech space. And I would say that I work for Amazon because that's so much easier. That's what the A stands for in AWS. If you didn't know, I'm sure you know. Okay. Everyone knows that, but Sometimes if I say I work at Amazon, the next thing that says like, I have this issue, I have this package or whatever. And so someone immediately tries to like find a way where I can then immediately be a value and reciprocate and be a use for them. And that, that turns me off a little bit. And I'm sure if you have been on the receiving end of this, you probably have the same reaction. Like, yeah, sure. Email me and I'll see what I can do. And then we might help them. You might not, but you kind of just want to slowly leave. Um, so that's not the reaction you want. And that's not the one you want to foster. So that's, this will also keep being grounded and being present in the conversation will allow you to kind of uh, really connect and on that level. So if you are able to be the person that goes the longest without asking that question, so where are you from? Asking that question, so what do you do? Uh, that's where you can actually start to really get into some interesting questions that, um, that really kind of connect on a personal level. 
And one thing that you also want to do when you're doing these connections is, I mentioned this before, but just drop your assumptions. Someone's married, uh, you're talking to a guy and they mention that they're married. You're just like, oh, what's your wife's name? What, what if their partner is uh, of another gender? Or what if their partner is not part of any gender? Um, you don't know this. And so try to leave those assumptions. Uh, also, that does, when, when you say, like, what do you do? What if this person is unemployed? Now it's, they're like, oh, well, I really am between jobs. Or I, I mean, I don't do anything. Or I'm a slob. You're right. I'm worthless. Let's leave. Um, you got to kind of make sure that you you don't put a person in a place where uh, you you kind of like make them kind of show um, their their level of privilege or their rank or their value. I've seen this also with uh, where did you go to school? Uh, and I personally, I went to the University of Texas in Austin for electrical computing, uh, electrical computer engineering, and uh, I dropped out. Uh, I didn't graduate. I don't have a degree, um, but sometimes I'll give that answer and sometimes I don't, or sometimes I avoid it. But sometimes people are, are like, if they don't have an answer, then it, it make, puts them in an awkward position. So you wanna be sensitive to that. The same where, where you're from, what if you're a refugee? Um, what, if, um, what if you're homeless? Or what if you're um, adopted and you actually don't have a really connection with your place that would be your origin of what people say? Um, so these are ways that you can rethink about some of your go-to questions and some of the things that you kind of lean on to kind of have conversation um, and try to, if you can, remove those from your repertoire of how you actually show up and meet people. Uh, so I kind of told you a lot of what not to do. And now you're like, okay, well, you told me, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Now, like, what do I do? <laughs> um, so let's go over some tips and some ways to kind of like get generally good at some of this. Uh, one is that um, it's really hard to meet people in groups. So if you can arrive early, uh, then it's more of a trickle. You get people as they show up, you get people um, as uh, they're waiting in line, uh, you can just turn next to them um, and it feels less overwhelming. To, to kind of be with people um, and just start that conversation with a small set of subset of people. If you're also looking for someone to talk to, you can just find the person standing alone. It's hard to initiate conversations and a lot of people don't. And if you're in an event, especially a networking event or a group, people do wanna to talk to other people, but they just also don't know how. Most people are bad and awkward. So just walk up to someone who's not talking to someone and you can start a conversation. That makes it really, really easy. Um, and then once you have that first conversation, it's, it makes it easier to have the second one. Not just you're lubricated and you're kind of like loosened up, but then you can say, do you know anyone else at this event? They can say yes, they can say no. If they say yes, they've met someone else. Then you can say, hey, you mind giving me an introduction? You bring them in. Now you're able to have a conversation. You get an introduction. You can have more people that you're networking with. If they say, no, I don't know anyone else here. You say, well, let's find someone. Find the wallflower. Find the person who's not talking to them. Bring them into the group. Make them feel more welcome. Uh, and, and if you, by chance, have to uh, get to get a person who, who is just really talkative and really dominating the conversation, or you've introduced more people and they're clicking, it's okay to move on, let them talk, and then just work with someone else. But one thing about networking though, is there's no time limit. If you are connecting, you got there, you connect with one person and you're like, all right, there's so many other people I could talk to, but I'm having a really good time with this person, spend time with that person. But on the other side, if you meet someone, and they are extremely unaligned with you. And they're talking about um, like super, from in my case, like super toxic masculine stuff that I was like really not into. Uh, they start like talking about the women that are walking around and being really degrading. Uh, that's, remember, I don't connect just for jobs and I don't connect just for um, access to other things. I connect to people. and. I don't care if this person 
is the CEO, a CTO, uh, really important? I'll be like, excuse me, um, I need to go to the bathroom or uh, I'm going to need to get a refill on my drink or uh, I need to get some air. I come up with an excuse uh, and then just excuse yourself in the conversation. You don't have to stand up if it's not comfortable for you to say, I think that's out of bounds. Um, I think that's rude. Um, sometimes it's not easy to call people out. And so I'm not saying that you need to do that. Use your level of comfort. But there are several different ways. If you say, I'm sorry, I have like uh, explosive diarrhea, no one's going to stop and say, no, we need to finish this conversation. You just, you get a head out. Um, and so it's, a, it's important, like once you find someone who's unaligned to kind of not keep them from keeping you to meet other people. The other thing is like, let's say you do meet someone, you've introduced yourself, but now you were paying attention to their story and then they pause and they look to you and you're like, now you have to say something. Now you have to respond. You've complimented them. You said that's a really great story, but now you need to talk. What questions do you ask? Especially when you've I've took away all of your questions. And this is a tool that I use to be able to have continuing conversations that will last indefinitely if I want them, is to focus on the journey. So if you think of a point of time, like right here, and the time before that is before we met, and this is the time we met, and the time is after we've met. When you're trying to connect with someone, you always have this point of intersection. I don't care if I'm running into Oprah. I don't care if I'm running into the person who's working the event. No matter what path they took, what, what path I took, we are in that same spot. And that's what we have in common. So you always have something in common at that one point. What you do is you define that point. You talk about that point. What brought you to this conference? How did you hear about this conference? Why did you decide to go to this party? What is your connection to Jack and Steve and at their wedding? That point of connection is something, it doesn't matter who you are or who they are. You can always connect on that part of the journey. And then what you do is you just take that slider and you move it either a little further back or a little further forward or way farther back or way further further forward. Oh, did you fly in today? Uh, did, what session did you go to today? Uh, what, what was the line coming in? There are things that you can talk about further back in the journey you need to, or what got you into tech? Or how did you decide that you want to uh, move to whatever or whatever? You know, there, you can go as far back in the journey as you can. And then you can also go further forward in the journey. What session are you going to after this? Okay, um, what, when, when is the next event that you'll be speaking at? Or I see that the holidays are coming up. Do you have any vacation plans? Once you lock into the journey and understand that you have this slider, you can always make that connection with anyone at any point in time. And then you could always move that slider back and forth and just realize that everyone's life is a journey that is so full of different spectrums and rainbows and happiness and sadness. It is such a, a treat when I meet someone because I'm not just being exposed to one person, I'm being exposed to a whole world of things that they have experienced and having a really good conversation helps unlock that. So once you've made that connection, what you wanna do is then you wanna lock it in in terms of let's connect on LinkedIn, let's connect on Mastodon, let's connect on like text or WhatsApp or whatever, threads. I don't know what the kids are using these days. Um, and so once you have, you wanna con continue that connection and just say, hey, let's keep in touch. Um, I really valued our conversation. Uh, I wanna make sure that, you know, we can, we can um, if it makes sense to have another conversation or another meetup, or maybe we'll be at another event again. So once you've done all that work of making that connection, you, you don't want to lose it. So make sure you do that. Um, and what you want to do is so when you do connect, don't like send a message right away or send or connect on all of the different channels. Don't turn into a stalker. Okay. They're cool. Just you be cool. All right. Don't, don't do any awkwardness. Um, I know we're all awkward, but just like, let it happen. Let it simmer. Um, so that's, that's my presentation of how 
to not be awkward when you're trying to engage with someone. And so let's look at the summary of uh, it's okay to be uncomfortable, uh, be interested in what they're saying, focus on their journey, uh, don't, don't spend time or waste time with the unaligned, and then make sure you follow up. So make sure you do that connection. Um, and we ha I have four minutes, uh, and so I'm going to speed run this last part. All right. So I talked about how that was how to be interested, and now this is how to be interesting. Um, so um, don't be an expert. Don't bloviate. Don't talk about, all right, so when you're at layer one of the network attach layer, this is what you what's kind of there. And then, you know, don't bloviate. Don't over explain. Don't kind of like show off your knowledge. Um, I can say, yeah, I work for a large tech company. Um, I don't necessarily say I work for AWS um, or I work with developers. Um, but saying, you know, I'm head of all of North America, which is United States and Canada, of every user group that covers uh, tech for AWS. That's that's kind of my job. And, it, you know, if you ever wanted to be a user group, you need to go through me because you know, I'm the person that controls that. I don't do that. I don't like show off. Um, so try not to show off. Um, don't make separation statements um, saying, oh, you know, those people who believe in that, uh, those are not my people. Uh, or, you know, if you use Linux, then you're just, you're just not a good person. Uh, Linux sucks and the tools there suck. I do not believe this. This is just reenactment. Okay. All right. So, uh, don't ever say those statements where you kind of put a, a stake in the, in, in, uh, in the sand and just say like, this is my stance on something. Um, especially when you know that, you know, let people be their own people. Let they, let them under, let them like, you know, don't yuck their yum. If they like something, let it be. Okay. Um, and um, don't make it about you. Uh, sometimes I've heard conversations like the Norse Noah story when someone says, and that's how I came to owning this arc. And then you turn around saying, yes, I make canoes as well, but I use a satin finish. And that's how I kind of make it so that it's, it's smooth, but also very distinguished. Because when you use raw wood like that and it's just treated, I think it doesn't really have personality. But my thing, that, that's, I mean, that's the epitome of how you make canoes. So I, don't do that. Don't just like use everything someone says as a way to refocus it back onto you. Be inquisitive, learn about them. And it's okay if it's just, you stay in a little bit more time on them. It's really okay. Don't feel like you need to make sure. Oh, did I also tell you that I make artisanal cheese? I know I didn't say that before, but um, yeah, don't worry. Don't try to keep throwing it back onto yourself. Um, add to the conversation. If someone asks you a question, make sure you talk about like your experience, but don't just let it sit there. Say like, okay, and how did you deal with conflict when you ran into it? And, and find ways to like make sure it's a good back and forth and don't let it just settle onto you. When someone does go into what I do and I say, I work in tech, but I don't then ask them what they do. I was like, well, what do you do for fun? Are, are, do you spend most of your time is, do you do other things other than work? So, um, those are some tips on uh, how to be interesting. I will maybe save that for another presentation. I'm at time, um, but uh, I'm very interested in the Q&A. So let's go ahead and get started. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Wesley. That was awesome. Um, unlocking the wonderful journeys of the beautiful people we meet. Uh, and that's sort of what I took away and I love it. Um, so we have... Um, our Q and A now. I am certainly taking the challenge of being the person who lasts the longest without asking those two questions. That is so good. Thank you. Uh, it's 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 amazing what your gymnastics you'll do in your head when you don't ask those questions. Um, I didn't get to this, but the reason why that you try to avoid also answering that question is because you don't want people to have um, that story about you. When I was uh, trying to switch careers and I was networking at events where I actually kind of didn't belong, I would, someone say, 
what do you do? And I wouldn't answer that question because I didn't want to tell them that I was not in that space. The mm-hmm. great thing though, is when you bring in a second person and they, the second person, the, the first person introduces you to the second person and they don't know what you do. That's when they tell the best stories. This is Wesley. He's an awesome guy. He's a great guy. <laughs> and it allows them to like transfer your personality to the other person rather than those little tags that kind of define you, or at least they think that defines you. I also find, uh, I liked uh, some of the example questions you, you mentioned about, you know, like what brings you here. Um, um, I usually also find like, uh, did you learn something new or did you meet someone interesting? Or um, I think those, those are indeed the, better question because that's about now and about what people are currently sort of in the mindset of so yeah awesome yeah and if you if you ask someone uh, what do you do i i've i've had that asked to me before and if you're really unhappy in your current position or your job it it can be like a real downer for the rest of the conversation so yeah (laughs) yeah what do you do? I cry. Um, yeah, I cry in the every fetal night. position. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't wait to turn off my computer. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, Sarah, uh, you're going to do the Q and A, right? Uh, do you have? Do we have a lot of cues to A? Yes, um, we do. Um, I'm going to start first with uh, Fleurs um, because you had uh, quite a few questions um, for your part. Um, so the first question came from uh, Samit. Uh, Singh uh, Baya, Baya, I hope I have it uh, said correctly. Um, uh, and he asked a question, is Discord better than Twitter live chats? Uh, um, I have used both mm-hmm. and I did not get enough results on Discord. Is this for hosting events or? Um, he asked it directly after, uh, the slide, which, oh, now I'm have to go back to my slides. Cause I, I talked about discord just because like, uh, some conferences will use discord as a means of asking questions, like doing the Q and a or, or, um, any of the conference communications. So, uh, I don't, I don't have any preference either way. I think we should just know when we uh, join an event, what they prefer and use that and not be sort of like, uh, no, we want to use the tool that we prefer. And that's not that's not how you participate in an event. You're a, you try and be the best participant you can be. So if that if that was the question, then uh, <laughs> then that is my answer. <laughs> Great. Um, I, so uh, if if it's the right question, I think uh, Sumit. Uh, I see he's live uh, there, so he can say something. If it's not. Um, uh, do you want to ask the next question, Wendy? Or yeah, okay. Yeah. So um, I saw a question from Deepak Kumar, mm-hmm. um, and Deepak is asking basically if Devel uh, fills up the vacuum left by traditional marketing, product, and engineering, um, is it therefore disorganized? Um, do you agree? Um, so sorry, Devel fills up the vacuum left by traditional marketing, product, and engineering. Hence, it is disorganized. Do you agree? <laughs> uh, so so DevRel is disorganized or community is disorganized or... I, like, I think uh, maybe what he means... The is... nature of events is like the nature of, of participating in events is, you know, like the, because those are organized by people outside of like an, if it's a third party event, like that's organized by someone else than you. And so there's only so much of control that you can have. And um, um, uh, asserting some some level of control uh, within like the, the opportunities that that an event offers to you is what you can do. But I but I don't think that I don't know if that answers that question at all. Uh, I feel like it's more of a statement also than a question that I can yeah. necessarily answer. But maybe Wesley, you have like, you have something to add there. I, I feel like the, the level of level of organization lives up to the the functionality of the, the organization. So I've I've been in places where DevRel has been super disorganized because that's usually a cultural issue rather than an actual definition of developer relations. Some places will have a plan. And then the plan gets thrown out three months later, and then you have to come up with another plan. And then that gets thrown out six months later to the point where planning feels like it's just an exercise, not 
of something that is actually useful. And so plans get thrown out the window. And so if you're an extremely disorganized organization, DevRel can seem disorganized, but it's not defined that way. If you are an organization that's extremely rigid, rigid, and then you have these gaps in either marketing or you have in sales or whatever, and those gaps don't have a place for this stuff and it goes into DevRel and DevRel is able to form that, a structured organization can actually work very well for DevRel. Um, I think usually that is not a function of DevRel to answer that question. That is a cultural question of the corporation. Yeah, I agree. I think also sometimes it, it has to do with positioning or having having a shared and clear sort of understanding of what the goals or the objectives are. So uh, why are we building a community? Um, what, what is the community going to help with? Uh, who, who are we going to help? And I think lacking that understanding or at least a shared understanding of that can sometimes create some disorganization um but uh, i agree with you it's it that's not related to death well that's that's just a, a cultural issue that that can apply to anything yeah so i have another question um also from uh, sumit um he uh, posted it around the trip report uh, slide so to get context Thanks. um thought uh, different markets, different expectations from the audience. Any tip for global audiences and meeting expectations? <laughs> so having just so like my, uh, I'm, I'm based in the Netherlands and for most of the companies I've worked for, uh, is I'm, my work is very focused on sort of the uh, European uh, uh, market. Uh, and so very recently I went uh, to uh, I went to India to go to DevOps Days India or DevOps Days uh, Bangalore, I must say. And uh, we wanted to host a uh, meetup event. Well, I mean, I'm there for a couple of days, so, so uh, uh, might as well try and figure out if we can do a meetup uh, on the day that I'm still there and, and don't have a conference to, to go to. Um, and I, uh, I was fortunate enough to have find, find a couple of friends that uh, were also DevOps Days organizers or, or related, and uh, they helped me out figuring out what is even the best time to host an event. And uh, turns out that is not on weekdays uh, in Bengaluru because then the traffic is just ridiculous. You don't, you're, you won't manage to get from uh, your uh, office to a meetup location. Whereas in Europe, that is very normal, right? Like in the evening hours, we have, uh, I'm looking at Sarah and Wendy, like we have meetups in the evening. Um, there we hosted a meetup on a Sunday and apparently meetups during the weekend, completely fine. Uh, that's, that's something people show up to. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't have known, right? Like I wouldn't have known if I hadn't uh, found help from others to uh, to find out, you know, like what are the cultural norms and what what goes, what doesn't go. Um, so I, I always find it super interesting to look at other geos and how uh, a lot of the things that we take super for granted will always work is the template. Uh, it doesn't work somewhere else. Yeah, I actually have something to add to that one too. Um, uh, because it, there's differences in cultures when it comes to time expectations. So if you are um, speaking, for example, to a German crowd, they want everything to be on time. That means finish on time. That means stop the Q&A Q right when it needs to be done, etc. However, if you're talking, let's say, to a South African uh, crowd, they want it to be finished. <laughs> Uh, they they want you to to be connected. And if it means going over and having a delayed schedule and being a little bit late, it's OK. So um, it really depends on uh, culture and where you're at. And I think if you're going to be speaking at a conference at a different country, take a look at their uh, indexes of the, what differentiates them from a culture. Otherwise, what you might do that's really great for a German crowd, for example, will completely miss uh, in another crowd and they'll think, wow, they're so rude. They just left. They didn't finish our questions. Like that. Yeah, that's, that's so so true. Like I remember um, we had just sort of started organizing meetups um, for a company I previously worked at Skills Matter back in 2003. 
Um, and um, sort of learned like, oh, you always have to go for drinks after because that's when, when what people enjoy most. Uh, that was what the people were uh, giving us feedback, like they really loved the conversations. They liked the presentation very much as well, but uh, connecting and uh, and talking with each other was was it. And then we organized our first meetup in Glasgow um, and we had everything prepared. We had uh, asked everyone, like, what, which pub is near? We had planned our location close to that pub. We had figured out how to bring everyone there safely. And no one uh, came came along <laughs> because uh, everyone just wanted to go home and uh, said, like, look, I've got a family and um, I want to be home with, uh, with my, my, uh, my uh, partner and kids. So, um, yeah, uh, location matters and uh, you have to ask not just um, questions about the location, how to get there, but also what, what's best for, for everyone joining. It's like planning a, a vacation. Uh, whenever I travel to a foreign land, I take a look at what are the cultural norms? Do I tip or don't tip? Uh, uh, it's, it's the same hmm. thing. Exactly, exactly. Um, so um, I've seen a lot of um, more sort of thoughts and comments um, rather than uh, questions, uh, but I think they're still very interesting and, and maybe uh, inspire some further conversation as well. And I think uh, just some some are just really nice, and I like to share them. Um, so Johannes Dean says, um, I always get so many and new ideas and viewpoints on problems. And I'm chewing um, that I can chew up uh, on at uh, at conferences. Thanks for the talk. I should be as organized as you are, Laura. Uh, that sounded awesome. And then Avacaso Coaching says, "Oh, sorry, that's you, Sarah." <laughs> uh, says me too. I feel all developers and tech leaders should go to conferences to keep themselves up to date and their brains sparked. And I think that's very much what you said as well. Like. Um, at um, uh, if you're the booth um, for for your company, maybe at an event, really, really participate in the conversations that you can have and and share the conversations and um, um, uh, how did you call them anecdotes um, and bring them back uh, back to to the office and don't, for example, sit at your booth uh, typing away or or uh, worse exactly during the break doing a conference call with some colleagues somewhere um, mm -hmm. because you miss out on uh, on 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 the best part really um, so um and then um how's the weather ah Wesley you've described every Irish conversation <laughs> ever <laughs> so I thought that was quite uh, good but um uh, people were also saying uh, so relatable and um someone said something about um, a list that you shared about um, things you should think of and things that might make you feel awkward um, and that, that is very relatable which I can't find right now but um, um, that was really appreciated. Um, so that was my little sort of interim update on some of the components. Have, have you got some more questions Sarah? Um, there's only one more question for Flores that I saw uh, um, and a question from Samit about what the ideal length of each session in a DevRel conference. In a DevRel conference? Yeah. Like on a DevRel con or, or something like that? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Like I, I think every, every session format and length has some merits, right? Like, and it depends very much on the crowd that you're addressing. So if you have a very academic crowd, they usually the talks last a lot longer than I can bear. <laughs> so um, for, for for me, it's usually like perfect between twenty and thirty minutes because otherwise, like I'll you know, uh, um, uh, then then I'll I'll need a new topic to be uh, to be energized again. But like I that that I, I feel like that depends very much on the on the audience that you will have in the room and not so much on the on the speaker. So. Yeah, and um, probably also on the interaction. Um, if, uh, if I, I will also zone out, but if you're bringing someone on stage or you're doing like you're changing something in it, then it can last longer also, it, attention wise. <laughs> also, how many tracks are going to be running simultaneously? Yeah, that matters. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I've got a, another question for, for Wesley. Um, there's an app from uh, someone called Sana T. And um, he or she asks, if someone already spoke at conferences, oh, no, sorry, that's not the question. I saw a really good question. Um, uh, if both set out. Yeah, uh, yeah. that one, yeah. Um, if both set out to listen and let the other talk, so imagine 
both people are uh, talking uh, or, or uh, setting out to listen um, and don't want to interrupt the other one, what do you do then? I love that one. I love that question. Well, someone has to have had been talking, right? And you say hi, the other person says hi back. Now it's on you, right? And then you might share, like use the journey of like, so what brings you to this thing? And then the other person has to answer. If it can't get to the point where someone is just listening, because one of the tips is digest what they're saying, repeat about like what you find valuable or interesting, and then put give a little of yourself and then send it back to them. And then they should do the same. If someone is uh, in the point where they it doesn't feel like they're participating, then unfortunately, I don't think that you can actually have a conversation at that point. Um, it takes a give and take. It takes like people participating for it to be a really, um, be able to have that kind of connection and conversation. Um, so that'd be one which if I was talking to someone and they were like, uh-huh. <laughs> I would be like, oh, look at the time. Uh, what's that over there? I don't know, but I'll go find out and then I'll just move over. Yeah. That's like, I need to go to the restroom break uh, thing again, huh? <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We're like, it's hey, is, is that over there? Let me. <laughs> yeah. There's something that um, uh, definitely when we do the sort of like intro words for uh, DevOps days is something that we introduce uh, to the audience is that they need to uh, keep their, if they're speaking amongst, uh, amongst a group that they keep a spot open for someone else to join, which is the Pac-Man yeah. rule. So it always yeah. make sure that someone else can still join your, your conversation. Um, and I love it whenever you walk through the hallway and at a DevOps days and people are actively practicing it and also are yeah. actively like calling it out that they're practicing it. I love when that happens. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I've heard it also called the croissant rule as well. Oh, I like that better. I like yeah. me a good croissant. <laughs> yeah, that's how I thought it was, um, or how I learned the the term for it. Yeah, yeah, but it works really well, and uh, yeah, and I think it is good to remind people as well at the start of a conference. Um, people generally do want to be inclusive and open and and meet other people. That that's one of one of the strong reasons of of going to conferences. But they sometimes forget this easy practice that makes it uh, makes it happen much much easier and and better. You want to take the next question, Wendy? Um, I haven't found a okay, question then, yet. Then so. I'll grab it. Um, Thank there's you. Another one from Sana. Um, if, and that's the one that you uh, started before. If someone already spoke at conferences, ask what they thought about, talk X or ask them what the person of their attendance is, question mark. The purpose of their attendance? Yeah, or if someone already spoke at the conference, ask what they thought about, talk oh. at, or ask them what the purpose of their attendance is, question mark. Oh, okay. So if someone's coming off stage, then it doesn't feel appropriate to say, so what brings you here? Yeah. Right? I guess maybe that's it. Um, so how do you have that conversation or where do you meet? Um, so you could also, if let's say you're talking to a speaker, of course, give some feedback about the thing that they just did. Um, so maybe talk about like, thank you for taking my question. Thank you for coming to this event. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Uh, how did you come up with that concept? Or how long have you been working on that talk? Or, or, or I had one part that I didn't really understand. Could you help? Could you elaborate on this one part? So you already, so the questions that I, I, put out there before about what brings you here, all these these questions. These are examples. These are not like a, a starter pack of things that you need to say. So be really fluent, flu, uh, fluid with this. Don't necessarily feel like, okay, now I, I just replaced this set of questions or where are you from and what do you do with these new set of questions that I'm going to ask. Bring out uh, the index so, cards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't feel like you, you have to use those questions. Um, try to think about what's going to be most relevant. If you're talking to someone, that is, if you're wanting to go and talk to someone, sometimes that is the thing where you start. 
uh, if it's someone who's standing here by yourself, just by themselves, just say, Hey, I see you're, you're here. Are you interested in, in having a conversation? I would love, I'm trying to meet new people. If they came off the stage, say, Hey, I, I know you, you just came off the stage. I don't know if you're overwhelmed, but I would love to take a, a minute of your time to have a conversation if you're okay. There are, there are different things and different ends to kind of have your starter question. Think about what feels good to you. Think about what makes sense in during the situation and go with that. This is something you're, you're really going to have to fill your way through rather than feel like it's very formulaic and you know how to like do the thing to say like, am I doing the networking now? You have to actually kind of understand if you're a, and I don't mean this in a physical or romantic sense, but if you're attracted to someone, um, go ahead and explain why you are. Um, I think what you're saying was very brilliant. I would love to be able to have a, a, a deeper conversation. Um, I really love your jewelry. And uh, I would love to be able to, to get something that is just so unique as that piece that you have on. Find, find a thing that you are attaching to that kind of conversation. And it's okay to kind of start from there if you need to. Yeah. Flora, do you have anything to add to that? No, I don't think so. Wesley puts it so elaborately. I know. <laughs> I know. It's just brilliant. Um, I saw a question from Vasilika Klimova, um, and I think it's a question for, for, for both of you. Uh, what can you recommend if someone is just very rude at work or at the talk? Explosive I'm, I'm, diarrhea. <laughs> well, unfortunately, <laughs> this happened to me more than once. Um, uh, people being very rude at events, uh, usually trying to guess what I do. Uh, which never turns out nicely. Um, or um, the famous, uh, you know, like more of a comment, less of a question, and then, you know, sort of like ranting on this or uh, attaching to the wrong thing and, and, uh, and sort of like hammering on something that you've, you have said. Uh, definitely happened more than once. Uh, I think it uh, takes a lot of uh, grace and energy to handle these uh, type of situations. Um, usually, whenever I think that a question is going into the wrong direction, I will say something like, let's, uh, let's grab some time after this, because I feel like this is uh, going a little bit off topic. And so it's maybe it doesn't serve everyone in the room to, to spend time on answering this particular question. But I will take your question uh, when I come off stage. And then I'll never find them. Curiously, I will never find them in the hallway. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah. Um, uh, try and and make sure to sort of like steer away from from those those type of uh, conversations because those are not the type that you want uh, at an event because it's not giving you any energy um, and it's not giving any of the uh, people in the audience uh, energy either. That's right. One one thing I would say is that you're not obligated to participate. Um, if someone's being rude, you do not need to like. You could be the person on that conversation where you're just listening. You could be just like, and if that's what you wanted, you, you are not obligated to um, humor them. You're not obligated. It, it, it depending on the if it's something public. Of course, you want to kind of defer them. Just say like, yeah, I'll talk to you. I think what Flora said is exactly uh, on point in a place where it could be disruptive to a group of people. If it is a, a person that's coming up to you one-on-one, -on -one, you could always just, like I said, you can make an excuse where you have to excuse yourself. You could choose not to participate. Uh, you could also just be like, one sec, and then turn around and just go away. <laughs> um, I've done that before too. Be like, oh, hold on, and then just leave. Uh, and um, it's okay. It's just, you don't have to participate in someone who's going to be extremely rude. I think one of the most important lessons I've learned is from one of the organizers of Devil Place Oslo, who said that if someone comes up to you and says, can I give you some feedback? It is totally okay to say no. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I never thought of that, but you can totally say no if they ask you if they can give you feedback. Uh, yeah. yeah, I've definitely used that since. Yeah, I'm not sure in the Q&A if we're allowed, but I love to ask Flora a question. Can I sneak one in? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right, so I, I'm slightly coveting your spreadsheet for events. Um, and 
question is that when you do your spreadsheet about saying these are the panels I'm going to go to, do you come up with a plan B or a plan C? Meaning yes. that if, yes. okay, so yes. if it's a, as a panel that's just not working for you, get up and yes. go to the next one, or if it gets canceled, or if you, if it's like uh, at an event where there's a line out the door, you won't be able to get into that specific session. Okay. Yeah. So, and that's specifically yeah. true also for FOSDEM, which is the example that I used is that uh, first of all, the rooms are very, uh, very far uh, apart from each other. So you need to plan for those, uh, if, you know, for the commute time between the different rooms. Uh, but typically like the ones, uh, well, typically the ones that I go to are all about policy and nobody wants to go to the policy talk. So that's, that's mm. like, a, I'm usually good in that regard. But um, there are definitely talks that are more popular and there will be a queue standing outside. And so there there will be, mo there mostly will be a backup talk. And otherwise there's backup activities because I will still need to visit the booths. And so maybe that's an activity that I will, you know, pull up earlier in the event. And so mm -hmm. instead um, uh, go to talks uh, later on in the day that I would have otherwise maybe not attended because I had planned uh, a tour of the booths at that time. So yeah. Okay. All right. Yes. All right. Thank you for humoring, humoring me with that question. <laughs> so, um, also, I'm, I'm interested in so many things. So it's very hard sometimes to make the decision, right? So like sometimes I will uh, um, delay or defer that decision time to when and when you know like time actually comes. Makes sense. So, so I think we have time for one more question. Um, so um, I first wanted to ask Flora, maybe actually, do you do you have any question for Wesley, or uh, or shall we take uh, another question from the audience? I would not not necessarily a question. I would love to role play this. Like, can we? Could we? We should. We should <laughs> like, this should be. This should be a workshop where people could role play the whole conversation. I think that would be. I think that would be so useful. Um, absolutely. Awesome I idea. I have done this as a workshop. I have done You've this done as a workshop. workshop? That's so good. Yeah, it's fun. But it's the, well, look, it's not fun, actually. Um, it's a really bad idea to do it as a workshop because I have done it. And when you have a panel saying awkwardness of networking and everyone is awkward and you're like, okay, now we're going to do it. Who wants to volunteer? And no one raises their hand. <laughs> <laughs> who has questions? No one asks questions. And it's because when you have people who are just like not wanting to put themselves out there, sometimes it just, you get crickets. So yes, there, it'd be nice. Yeah. If, yeah. Yeah. It'd be nice if it worked, but you would think so, but yeah, if it hasn't worked out for me. I don't know if we have time though for one question. Um, yeah. I, there were two questions at the very end, uh, Wesley. <laughs> Um, and they were the ones I was most interested in because I always feel the most awkward uh, around how to uh, get into a group when they're talking. I, uh -huh. I, I, I really am afraid of it. Like, I, I don't like to penetrate into that group, but also how to interrupt without being like a total ass. Like, that's my. <laughs> um, um, yeah, that, that was on my slide. I didn't cover it. was it. on your slide and then you ran yeah, out of time. So I was like, yeah. if we have time for a question, like All I right. would love that. All right, quickly, if you have a drink or is it, if it's around the table, ask if you could set your drink down. Um, but what you want to do is identify the weak person in the group, meaning the person who's participating the least, so that when you're interrupting, you say, can I put my drink down? That's an excuse where you can test kind of like the the ability for you to merge in the group. If they give you a weird look, a rude look, or they just don't want to interact with you, you know that you will not be able to break into that group. If they're like, oh yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, then you can say, oh, thank you very much. You're so nice. And then you can say, oh, and then you can start that conversation. And that's how you can get into a group. That's gold, that's gold. Yeah, so basically you have an excuse to kind of like not interrupt rudely, but you were like, Hey, it's hard if I just and then find, but you have to identify which is not the person actively talking at that time in order to do that. Very nice. And then, Maybe. then, then, then you can use stuff like, "Oh, what are they talking about? Are are you all talking about blah blah blah? Or did you hear about this? Or did you all come together? Do you all know each other? Did you?" And then you're able to then kind of like enter into the conversation. Exactly. Awesome. Okay, so I have, I have, it is exactly half past the hour in whatever time zones we are. So I think we did quite well, even to um, some standards in some countries where we have to finish <laughs> on time. I knew yes. you were going to tell you that. thinking <laughs> the Germans will be happy, don't just joke. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really, uh, really good. So um, first of all, um, of course, 
Thank you all very much, um, Vesley, Flora, Sarah. Um, it was brilliant. Thank you, everyone in um, our wonderful audience tonight as well for asking good questions, sharing your thoughts. Sorry if we couldn't share everyone's questions or thoughts, but it doesn't mean it's not very appreciated. It is. Um, so I hope to, uh, that everyone enjoyed it uh, and to see everyone again sometime soon. Um, and um, if you uh, enjoyed uh, this meetup tonight, um, we uh, organized meetups quite regularly, not quite every month yet, um, trying to get to that point at some point, but uh, haven't uh, managed yet, but um, roughly every two months or so. And you can find out about those on uh, any of these channels. Um, and there's also a really nice LinkedIn uh, group uh, called LinkedIn Developers Community or bit.ly bit LinkedIn Developers Community, um, where uh, people have become quite active in sharing uh, about other events on DevRel, um, uh, some blog content, articles, uh, or just simply helping each other out with uh, with, with questions um, like, does anyone know a good videographer? Videographer. Um, so we do meetupvideo.com, which is um, Peter who's filming tonight. Um, but um, questions like that. So um, hope to see you all again. Thank you everyone for joining, and uh, goodbye.